In the previous video, we created a basic LED blinking example using Zephyr OS on the ESP32 microcontroller. It worked, but there's certainly room for improvement in the application firmware source code. In this video, we'll explore some possible improvements and learn more about the Zephyr APIs and the concept of device tree overlays. For our first improvement, notice that we've used a magic number in our code to specify which GPIO pin we're attaching the LED to. In this case, it's GPIO pin 25. Of course, we could create a pound define or a constant integer at the top of the file and then update that whenever the GPIO pin assignment changes. However, there might be a better way. So before we change anything in the code, let's take some time to understand a few Zephyr APIs that can help us out. In Zephyr, the device tree aims to capture all the configuration information about the device we're using. That way, we can decouple the application source code from the device configuration. There are several advantages to doing this, including the ability to abstract away physical GPIO pins and easily target different boards or even architectures without changing the application code. So, how can we decouple the GPIO pin number to the device tree? Well, we're using the magic number to call two different functions in our application source code, GPIO pin configure and GPIO pin set raw. Let's look at GPIO pin configure first. This function configures the GPIO pin and takes a pointer to a device struct, a GPIO pin T type, which is basically an 8-bit unsigned integer, and the GPIO flags T type, which is a 32-bit unsigned integer. It turns out that Zephyr provides a struct called GPIO DT spec which almost contains these three fields. The only difference is that the flags member uses the GPIO DT flags T type instead of GPIO flags T type. The first is a 16-bit unsigned integer and the second a 32-bit unsigned integer. However, the 16 bits are sufficient to express all GPIO flags that can be provided in a device tree, so it's fine to use in this case. The second function, GPIO pin set raw, also needs a struct device and a GPIO pin number. So we can use the same struct for that function as well. How convenient! But how do we populate GPIO DT spec with the device pointer, pin number, and flags? Here we go against the whole purpose of decoupling device information from application code if we simply initialized it in our source. But is there a way to change the device tree to include this information and if so, is there a way to retrieve the information from the device tree at compile time? I'm sure you've guessed that the answer is yes, and it's actually the way that the official Zephyr sample code for Blinky does it. Our first objective is therefore to update the device tree for our ESP32 board. To do that, we need to understand a few more things about how Zephyr generates the device tree when we build our application. As mentioned in the previous video, the device tree is a hierarchical representation of the capabilities and peripherals of a specific device. 
it turns out that there are several layers of files defining the final device tree. And these will differ between boards and architectures. There are two types of input files used to generate a device tree. Device tree sources and device tree bindings. Let's look at device tree sources first. In the case of the ESP32 board, the main device tree source file is called ESP32.dts. This file defines a few nodes, such as the root node CPU0 and CPU1. Additionally, it includes two other device tree include files. You can recognize the type from the file extension .dtsi. ESP32.dtsi defines slash Wi-Fi and several others. ESP32-pincontrol.dtsi defines the default pin configuration for UART, SPI and I2C controllers. ESP32.dtsi also includes another device tree include file called extensor.dtsi, which simply defines slash soc and another include file called skeleton.dtsi. Skeleton.dtsi can be used as a base for any architecture. Device tree bindings are YAML files that describe the device tree nodes, their data types, and which properties are required for each node. The main device tree binding file for the ESP32 is ESP32.yaml. In addition, there's a file for each of the supported drivers. These files are named according to the compatible property in the device tree file. This is typically the vendor name, comma, board name, hyphen, driver name. However, there are some generic drivers, like GPIO LEDs, whose files are just named after the driver. In this case, GPIO-LEDs.yaml. All the relevant device tree source files and binding files are processed through several steps and generate a final device tree file for the application. This file is found in the build slash Zephyr directory and is called zephyr.dts. Note that this is a very simplified view as there are several more steps than what I've shown. It's a good idea to review the final zephyr.dts file after a build to understand exactly which device tree nodes have been included and their configuration. As we've seen, the ESP32-related device trees are already defined as part of the Zephyr SDK, so we don't have to change anything there. However, we would like to add our own overrides that are application-specific. Zephyr provides exactly this capability through device tree overlay files. An overlay allows the application to add new device tree nodes or override existing default nodes and properties. We'll use this capability to specify the GPIO pin number we want to use for our LED blinking example. So that sorts out the device tree source, but what about the device tree bindings? Of course, we can create our own device tree binding for the GPIO setup, but luckily for us, there's already a suitable generic binding included in Zephyr called GPIO LEDs. GPIO LEDs groups one or more LEDs together and specifies the GPIO configuration, including which GPIO controller to use, the specific pin, and the configuration of that pin. For example, whether it's active high or active low. Let's create a new device tree overlay file in our application root directory and call it ESP32.overlay. 
we'll define a node directly under the root node and call it LEDs. Plural in case we want to add more LEDs and pins later. The compatible property refers to the YAML binding file we'll be using. Then comes the fun part. We create a new node and call it blinking underscore LED, since that is quite descriptive of what the intention of this LED is in our application. To make it easy to access this node without referring to the entire path, let's add a node label with the same name. Remember from the last video that node labels are put with a colon between it and the node name. We can see in the GPIO leds.yaml file that a GPIO's property is required, and it takes a p handle array. Don't worry about what a p handle array is at the moment, because we've already got plenty of new concepts to deal with right now. Enter which GPIO controller we will use, in this case GPIO0, since on the ESP32 this controller controls pins from GPIO0 to 31, as we discussed in the previous video. The GPIO pin number is 25, and we indicate that this pin is active high. That is, the LED will be on when pin state is high. Why this is useful will become clear in a while. That's it for the device tree overlay file. Build the application using West Build. If West, or rather Ninja, tells you that there's no work to do, you may need to run a clean build. I find it easiest to run West Build P to ensure a pristine build. The overlay file should now be included in the generated device tree. To check this, let's look at the zephyr.dts file in the build slash zephyr directory. And we see it's right there, included in the application build. Now that our GPIO pin is configured in the device tree, we need to find a way to reference it from our application code. In the previous video, we created a device struct to the pin controller itself. This time, however, we'll take advantage of the useful GPIO DT spec struct. It turns out that Zephyr provides a macro called GPIO DT spec get that takes a node identifier and the property we're interested in as arguments. So, instead of getting a device struct like we did in the last video, we'll get a GPIO DT spec struct. Also, since we're now referring to a group of LEDs, or just one in this case, instead of a GPIO controller, let's name the constant LED instead of device. We must still check if the device is ready, however. To provide the associated device to the LED pin, the GPIO DT spec has a member called port. If you haven't come across the word port in the context of GPIO pins before, some microcontrollers group sets of GPIOs into ports. For example, eight GPIO pins per port. This is loosely analogous to a GPIO controller for our purposes. Next, we'll configure the GPIO pin. We could use the same GPIO pin configure function and provide LED.port, LED.pin, and LED.dt flags as the arguments. However, there's a more convenient function called GPIO pin configure DT, which simply takes a pointer to the GPIO DT spec struct and GPIO flags T. So, we pass a reference to LED and keep the GPIO output active as the flag. I didn't mention in the last video that we also could have used the GPIO output flag and not make it active. But now that we've specified that our LED is active high, we might as well keep it in there. Finally, we can do a similar thing with our GPIO pin set raw function. But there's also a GPIO pin set DT function, which takes a GPIO DT spec pointer and the logical value of the pin. Note that this function takes into consideration whether the pin is active high or active low. But 
there's an even better function for our specific example called GPIO pin toggle DT, which simply takes a GPIO DT spec and toggles the pin high or low depending on the current state. We'll use this function since it clearly communicates our intent, and we don't need to use the clumsy repetition of calls and sleep. Let's refactor the code accordingly. Let's build and flash the updated code and see if it still works. It's basically doing the same thing as in our previous video, but uses slightly more idiomatic Zephyr code and decouples the hardware device declaration from the application code in a better way than our previous video's example. Let's build and flash the board as usual, and if everything goes well, we should still see the blinking LED. And we do! In the next video, we'll continue to explore more Zephyr APIs and specifically learn about Zephyr's interrupt service routines, or ISRs for short.